you're not going to believe this. I was on super real video game facts dot fake and I found a post that lays out exactly how to revive Aerith. It's super easy. First, you go to Midgar and you travel to Junon back and forth exactly 27 times without stopping. Then you get five copies of every Master Materia. Then you go to Shinra HQ and you flush the toilet exactly 10,000 times. I've done all of that and now I'm on my 9,999th flush. So let's flush it one more time and see what happens. Wait till the guys on Game Facts hear about this. Aerith Gainsborough, or Eris Gainsborough, or if you are a kid like me who is really into Greek mythology and totally read the name wrong but was never corrected because I had friends who also got names wrong all the time, Ares is the final remnant of a powerful ancient race, the mouthpiece and savior of the planet, and an upbeat, sometimes silly girl who often just wants to have fun. The parallels between Aerith's personality and her ultimate destination correlate perfectly with the overall themes of Final Fantasy VII. Aerith is the light within the darkness, the hope waiting at the end of a long and emotionally turbulent road, and the happiness disguised throughout an otherwise very dark and dismal story. Many of the light-hearted and comedic relief moments of the game involve Aerith, and throughout the journey, Aerith has the biggest influence on the main character of the game, Cloud, as she teaches him many lessons about being himself and following what he believes to be right. Although Aerith is not the main character of the game, she has arguably the most impact on the story and has the most memorable scenes. Aerith is the first and last thing you see in the game, and her death scene would become one of, if not the most popular and recognizable death scene in all of gaming. In addition, there are so many other memorable scenes including Aerith, but before we get to her timeline of events, let's talk about that name. To the eastern part of the world, Aerith has always and will always be known as Aerith, but to the western world, she is often called by a different name, Eris. The name Eris comes from the North American version of the game, which is the first version nearly all western fans played. Even to this day, all North American versions of the game have Aerith's name as Eris for simplicity's sake. Even though all the other games that featured her afterwards, including the Final Fantasy VII Remake, reverted back to the original Aerith. So why was Aerith's name changed to Eris for the North American version in the first place? It was changed during translation by the team at Sony Interactive. The reasoning isn't known for sure, but can be inferred. When games are translated from one language to another, translators will often discern the general meaning of a section, then use the second language's vocabulary to come as close to the meaning as possible. If the translator is unable to articulate the general meaning of a section, they may use a process called transliteration, where they simply extract the words from a section and replace them with the word closest to the word in the second language. Many old games suffer from very poor and confusing translations due to this process. However, sometimes transliteration is the only option you have. For example, with names, since most names are not part of general vocabulary and rather something created simply for the purpose of naming someone. When transliterating Aerith's name from Kana, however, something strange happens. The last character represents Su instead of the TH sound. This is because there is no pure TH sound in Japanese, so the closest native sound of Su is used. The problem was, Sony Interactive most likely had to flip a coin and decide whether or not to use SU, which is normally changed to simply S, or TH in the English version. 
Because it is very common for TH to be transliterated into a Z sound, and since the TH sound also has some issues in other international languages like German and French, it isn't surprising that the team ultimately went with S. However, hidden in the game's code, Eris's name is actually correctly translated to Aerith, and is only defaulted to Eris when the naming screen appears. On July 8, 2018, Final Fantasy VII speedrunners discovered a way to skip the section of the game where Aerith is named, and when she is automatically placed in the party later, her name is set to the game's internal default, which is Aerith. This is even more supportive to the idea that perhaps Sony knew that Aerith would be closer to the original version for the name, but chose Aerith anyway to fit better in English as well as the other international languages. Believe it or not, there is yet another version of her name, originating from an original concept art from her designer, Tetsuya Nomura, in which her name was written as Erith, which was probably just an early idea for her name, as he wanted the name to closely resemble the word Earth. I'll talk more about the symbolism of her first and last name later in the video when we talk about her development. But one more fun fact, the video file in Final Fantasy VII for Aerith's death scene is labeled as Erith DD. Aerith was born on February 7, 1985, to Afalna, the last pure blood of an ancient race known as the Cetra, and Professor Gast Faramis, the former head of Shinra's science research department. Gast, when realizing that Genova was not a Cetra, left Shinra and married Afalna, living happily with her while continuing his Cetra research by recording sessions with her in their new home in Icicle Inn. Not the inn, but their house. See, the whole town is called Icicle Inn, but there's only one inn. I, I don't understand it either. A few days after Aerith was born, Shinra tracked down the couple, leading to an altercation where Hojo killed Gast and captured Afalna and Aerith. The two would then become test subjects for Hojo's mad experiments until they managed to escape seven years later. They reached the train platform in Sector 5 before a fauna collapsed due to complications of Hojo's experiments and a lack of the drug she needed to suppress the effects. Elmira Gainsborough, a woman living in the Sector 5 slums, who was waiting at the train station for her husband to return from the Wutai War, met a fauna just as she was dying. A fauna asked Elmira to keep Aerith safe with her dying breath, so Elmira took Aerith home and began raising her as her own adopted daughter. Over the years, Aerith would attempt to hide her powers as a Cetra, but could still hear the voice of the planet, on one occasion even relaying to Elmira that her husband had died in the war and had returned to the planet. Shinra would one day find Aerith and attempt to coerce her into returning to Shinra HQ. They wanted Aerith not for the Cetra research that Hojo had been doing, but rather for help finding the Promised Land, an ancient place only the Cetra knew the location of, that Shinra thought would be a place of plentiful Mako in the perfect location for a new Midgar metropolis called Neo Midgar. However, because of the Wutai War, Shinra was in no position to build a new city, and since they now knew where Aerith was, they allowed her to stay with Elmira and simply kept an eye on her as she grew up. As Aerith grew up, she spent most of her time in the Sector 5 slums church. It was difficult to grow plants in the slums, but a life stream imbued river that passed by Elmira's house also passed underneath the church and allowed flowers to be grown there. During the events of Crisis Core in Year 1, or 2001 as we'd call it, a fight between Zack and Angeal would lead to Zack falling through the Sector 5 church and meeting Aerith. Zack would then ask Aerith out on a date, which she would decline before showing him around the Sector 5 slums. The two would then begin to bond during the tour. Zack would buy Aerith a pink ribbon, and the two would visit the Sector 6 playground. Zack would keep in contact with Aerith for the next two years, and would visit her on the fateful day that Zack would be forced to kill Angeal, and she would hold him as he cried. Zack would later suggest Aerith sell flowers again, and even build her a flower cart. Although Aerith would express fear over going topside to sell flowers, Zack would join her to sell flowers around the slums. Unfortunately, this would be the last time they would be together, as that day would be the day Zack would leave for Nibelheim and never return after the events of the Nibelheim incident. 
During the events of Before Crisis, Aerith meets the player Turk. Not a lot is revealed about Aerith during this time, although she does talk about a desire to leave Midgar and travel the world, but says that her mother would worry and there would be nobody to tend the flowers in the church. At the end of the events of Crisis Core, Zack would receive a letter from Aerith. The letter would talk about her success selling the flowers and reveal that she had written him 88 other letters which he had not received. In the final scene of the game, Aerith can be seen in the church tending her flowers. She stands up and looks at the sky, then gasps, indicating that she felt Zack dying from a distance, just as she felt Elmira's husband dying prior. On December 9th in the year 7, Aerith would first meet Cloud while trying to sell flowers on the upper plate. Later, Cloud would fall off of the plate and land in the Sector 5 church in the same exact fashion as Zack. The two would begin to learn more about each other, and Aerith would show Cloud a special materia her mother gave her, claiming it does nothing but she simply feels safe having it. They would continue to talk but be interrupted by Reno. Aerith asks Cloud to become her bodyguard and offers a date as payment. At the time, Cloud wouldn't understand exactly why Aerith knows the Turks, but he would help protect her from Reno nonetheless. The two would then bond more, and Aerith would introduce Cloud to Elmira. Elmira would ask Cloud to sneak out to protect Aerith, which he would agree to, but would be cut off by Aerith, who had already sensed the plan. She would force Cloud to bring her along to the Sector 6 playground, where the two would sit on the slide and discuss their past. Aerith would tell Cloud that her old boyfriend was also a soldier first class, but wouldn't reveal his name. The two would then spot Tifa in the back of a chocobo cart headed towards Wall Market, and from there Aerith would help Cloud infiltrate Corneo's hideout. After saving Tifa, the three would reveal Shinra's plan to drop the Sector 7 plate, and together they would rush to stop the impending disaster. Once they arrived at the plate, Tifa asks Aerith to find and protect Marlene, which she does by trading herself in for Marlene's safety. Aerith would let Tifa know that Marlene is safe before being taken away to Shinra HQ once again. With the Wutai War over for several years, Shinra was now ready to reinstate Operation Neo Midgar, so Professor Hojo begins to experiment on Aerith believing that she may be the only way to the Promised Land. However, he decides that the process of extracting the power from her given that she is only half Cetra and much weaker than her mother, could take up to 120 years. So he looks to breed her with another ancient race, the unnamed species of Cosmo Canyon, who tend to live hundreds of years. It is unknown how Hojo planned on breeding the two species, but it apparently involved placing them both in the same chamber and just hoping they would fall in love. At any rate, the newly formed avalanche party of Cloud Tifa and Barrett rescue both Aerith and Red 13, but the group are captured soon after by the Turks. In their holding cells, Aerith would once again remind Cloud of the date that she owes him, but would then begin to talk about her Cetra heritage. She would explain that the Promised Land was only ever described to her as a place that promises extreme happiness, and doesn't seem to know if it is even a physical location at all. Shortly after, the group would escape Midgar, and Aerith would express a desire to join them in their quest to find Sephiroth, as she knew he was somehow linked to the Cetra, and wanted to protect the Promised Land from both him and Shinra. In the Mithril Mines, if Aerith is in the party at the time, she will have a talk with Sung where he will reveal that the Turks' main objective is now Sephiroth instead of her. On the cargo ship headed towards Costa del Sol, Aerith talks to Cloud about the airship in Junon, and wishes to one day fly on it. In Costa del Sol, Aerith will attempt to grill Hojo on the identity of Genova and Sephiroth, and ask if they too have Cetra blood. Hojo would ignore her though, and Aerith would note that he was mumbling slowly, a clear sign that he must be hiding something. The party would later have an opportunity to meet Zack's parents in Gungaga, and if Aerith is in the party, she will be asked by Zack's parents if she was his girlfriend before panicking and running out of the house. When approached by Cloud, Aerith confirms that Zack was her first boyfriend before stating that he has probably found another girl. This seems to be a lie as it contradicts the Crisis Core ending scene, although it could have also just been retconned for the sake of having a more emotional finale. However, it does make sense that Aerith would lie here, as she may not want to risk Cloud revealing the truth to Zack's parents, who are still hopeful that Zack may return one day. 
A little while after, Aerith and the party obtain the Keystone, the key to open the Temple of the Ancients. Aerith wants to visit the temple both to stop Sephiroth from obtaining the Black Materia and summoning Meteor, but also to learn about her past, the Cetra, and her destiny. Before they can travel there, the party gets stranded in the Gold Saucer. During the night, Aerith can enter Cloud's room and ask him on a date. The outcome of who Cloud goes on a date with is based on a hidden in-game value which can go up and down based on decisions the player makes throughout their playthrough. Aerith starts with the highest value of all the date possibilities, and in addition, if there is a tie at the time of the date, the game will choose a date based on this priority, with Aerith on top. It can be inferred from this information that Aerith was the canon date, and the other dates are more of bonus material. But having said that, Aerith's date is actually pretty lacking in substance in terms of character development for Aerith. It is, however, very revealing for Cloud's story, as Aerith remarks that Cloud and Zack are two completely different people, but look exactly the same, and that she is still searching for the real Cloud, giving the player a clue to the main conclusion of Cloud's story. After the date, the party travels to the Temple of the Ancients, and Aerith's destiny begins to take shape. Up until this point, Aerith has had a feeling of a greater purpose, but has continually avoided it. Whether it be pushing back on her powers as a kid, refusing to go with the Turks to get experimented on by Hojo, or attempting a relationship with Cloud, she has always been neglecting her calling over fear of what it may bring. Now, of course, these decisions were all very valid, especially not letting Hojo experiment on her, but it was all a lead-up to this moment, where she has finally taken her destiny head-on, and what she learns in the temple will change her forever. This transformation is symbolized as soon as the party walks into the temple, as they see Sung nearly dying by the entrance. Sung has been a constant reminder to Aerith of her past with Shinra, always being the one to talk on their behalf, and always being the one to take her in. This moment symbolizes her final goodbye to Shinra, as she transforms from a little girl with a special power she doesn't understand, to the savior of the planet. The party leaves Sung for dead, although we later learn that he did survive, and enter the temple where Aerith learns of the Black Materia and Sephiroth's plan to use Meteor to become one with the planet. She then uses her powers to talk to the planet and learns that the temple itself is the Black Materia. The party then formulate a plan to use Kate Sith's body to retrieve the Materia, and before he leaves, Aerith asks him to tell her and Cloud's matchmaking fortune. It is unclear if she does this because she genuinely wants to know, since at this point she is getting very close to fully realizing her destiny and understanding what she must do to save the planet, or if she is simply being nice to Kate Sith before he is sent to his death. Kate Sith proclaims that Aerith and Cloud are a perfect match, which may be pointing at the fact that at this point Cloud is still the Zack version of himself, and then jumps off into the temple to get the materia. When the dust settles, Cloud jumps down into the hole where the temple was and retrieves the materia, only to be mind-controlled by Sephiroth. He tries to fight it, but relinquishes the Materia to Sephiroth, before turning around and attacking Aerith. Another party member then knocks out Cloud, and Aerith sends a message to him in his dreams. At this moment, or at some moment between the temple and when Cloud wakes up, Aerith has accepted her true destiny as a Cetra. She has decided that as the final Cetra, she must use her powers to become the savior of the planet, just as her ancestors did. She learns that the secret lies in the City of the Ancients, and she knows exactly what she must do. She tells Cloud that she has it all under control, and she wants him to worry about himself. Perhaps she feels guilty for leading the party into danger when only she has the power to protect the planet. She also knows the dangers of her journey, and what it will most likely result in. She disappears without a trace, but leaves a detail about the sleeping forest being the path to the city. She could have left this detail simply because Cloud asked, or she may have been leaving the clue on purpose, in hopes that the party would eventually find the city after her journey was over. Or, perhaps she knew that the party would also have a hand in saving the planet. Aerith would then make the journey all by herself to the City of the Ancients, where she would find a lost temple underneath the city and begin to pray for Holy, the ultimate white magic. She had learned the secret of the materia her mother had given her long ago, and was attempting to summon the power from within to stop Sephiroth and Meteor. The party then finds her, 
but Sephiroth quickly intervenes and attempts to control Cloud and have him kill her. Cloud successfully thwarts the attempt, and it seems Aerith has finished her prayer as she lifts her head and looks at Cloud. Suddenly, Sephiroth appears and falls from above the temple, impaling Aerith. Cloud holds Aerith's motionless body, launching into a monologue about his memories of Aerith and the validity of his feelings, before Sephiroth rises into the air and summons another Genova spawn for the party to fight. This moment, in the eyes of many fans, is one of, if not the best death scene in video game history. There are many things that make this death scene so great, from the absolutely brutal cutscene, to Sephiroth's demeanor afterwards, to Cloud's monologue, to the emotionally charged boss battle with Aerith's theme playing in the background instead of the normal boss music, to the overall shock of it all as the game did an amazing job selling the death as a surprise, allowing the player to purchase weapons and continue gaining limit breaks for Aerith right up until her death. It may or may not be the best death scene of all time, but it is without a doubt one of the most popular. Aerith's death was one of the most talked about scenes on the internet back in the late 90s and early 2000s, and Aerith revival hoaxes were incredibly popular on every well-known video game forum. The revival hoaxes almost always included ludicrous tasks the player would have to complete to revive her, and they were pretty good at fooling people because A, this was the early years of the internet and people still believed a lot of the information that was around to be true, and B, there are many small hints in the game that can be misconstrued as hints towards an Aerith revival. For one, you keep all of Aerith's weapons after her death, except the weapon and armor she had equipped when she leaves the party for the final time, right after the Demon's Gate boss battle. Probably the biggest hint towards a revival is Aerith's ghost in the Sector 5 church. After Aerith's death, if the player returns to the church, a ghost of Aerith can be seen tending to her flowers before mysteriously vanishing once Cloud gets too close. If you're fast enough, you can actually outrun the trigger for the ghost disappearing and attempt to interact with it. The popularity of these revival hoaxes cannot be understated, and hoaxes of Aerith's revival are still popular even today. I still receive comments on some of my videos asking me about hoaxes and asking if they are true or not. In 2013, speedrunners found and developed a glitch on the PC version of the game called Yuffie Warping, and with this trick you could bring Aerith from one save file to another, effectively carrying her past the death scene and playing with her on discs 2 and 3. This does work on all PC versions of the game, including the original 1998 port, but it doesn't work on the PS1 version and is obviously not an official way of reviving her. The Aerith death scene also had a profound impact on the character of Sephiroth, who would go on to be one of the most recognizable villains in all of gaming. It is revealed later on in the game that this Sephiroth is actually Genova, but is being controlled by the true Sephiroth in the North Crater, so you could say that both Sephiroth and Genova killed Aerith. As Aerith dies, the white materia falls from her hair and bounces into the water below, emanating a green glow, signifying that Aerith's prayer was completed. The party doesn't know this at the time though, and are devastated by her loss. Cloud pledges revenge, as the other members worry that there may be no way of stopping Sephiroth if Meteor is summoned. Before defeating him, Cloud finds his true self with the help of Tifa, in a scene where they both fall into the life stream and Tifa enters Cloud's subconscious. In the novel The Maiden Who Travels the Planet, which has been included in the Final Fantasy VII Ultimania Omega, but may or may not actually be part of the Final Fantasy VII canon, it is explained that Aerith used her powers from within the life stream to guide Tifa to Cloud's subconscious and protected them both as they fixed Cloud's psyche. The book may not be canon, but it does offer an explanation as to how both Cloud and Tifa made it out of the lifestream unharmed and somehow washed up on the shore of Medeal where the other party members could find them. Later on in Cloud's quest, he returns to the City of the Ancients with Bugenhagen and an ancient key that turns on the machinery hidden within the city. The machine displays an image of Aerith's death and reveals to the party that Aerith did succeed in calling Holy but Sephiroth is blocking it from inside the planet's core. 
It is unknown how the ancient machinery displays an event that happened just recently, but it does allude to Aerith's journey and how it may have been prophesized long ago. It is also unclear if Aerith knew that Sephiroth would be able to block Holy, and we don't know if Aerith's powers were so great that she knew the party would eventually defeat him, or if she was foolish and summoned Holy oblivious to Sephiroth's plans. Either way, the party does eventually defeat Sephiroth, and as Meteor begins to destroy the planet, Holy is released to stop it. The power of Holy, however, isn't enough as Meteor has already fallen too far. But then, the life stream, controlled by Aerith, comes to the aid of Holy, and together they push it back and save the planet. A flash of Aerith's face, just as it was the first thing seen in the game, is now the final image before the credits roll. After the events of the game, but before the events of Advent Children, it is explained that Aerith attempted to stop the spread of Geostigma, a disease created by Sephiroth's genes tainting the life stream during the final moments of the game. It is explained in On the Way to a Smile, Lifestream White, that Aerith attempted to heal the spirits of those affected by the virus from within the life stream, but was unable to heal them fast enough. In Advent Children, Aerith appears to Cloud in a vision. Cloud tells Aerith that he is looking to be forgiven, which she responds to with, By who? And later she explains, I never blamed you. Not once. You came for me. That's all that matters. In the final act of the movie, Cloud defeats Sephiroth, who had been reborn from the remnant Kadaj, and Aerith summons a healing rain from the sky which cures people of their geostigma, a callback to her final limit break in the original game, Great Gospel, which depicts a holy rain and angels descending from the sky. Aerith also speaks to Kadaj, who mistakes her for Genova, which is an interesting detail as Kadaj is a remnant of Sephiroth, but Aerith still extends a hand of compassion to him. She is then seen one final time in her church, where she walks through the doors with Zack right beside her. We now get to talk about Aerith as a playable character, and boy have I waited to talk about this one. Final Fantasy VII has a very unique character system, shying away from the typical class system of previous games, and instead making the characters more similar stat-wise, and allowing the player to customize them further with the use of materia and equipment. We have talked in this series in the past about characters like Tifa, who is meant to be more of a physical fighter, and Kate Sith, who is meant to be more of a mage. But in reality, any character can be anything in Final Fantasy VII, because of the extreme customization options available to you through the Materia system. But then, there's Aerith. If there was ever a character in Final Fantasy VII who was meant to be pigeonholed into a specific class, it would be Aerith, boasting the highest MP, magic, and magic defense stats by a landslide. She is also the only character in the game to have no damaging limits. This makes Aerith the obvious magic caster, but because of the Materia system, she works as an incredible white and black mage, easily out-healing and out-damaging any other party member with magic. Her weapons also support her mage-like qualities, having generally bad attack stats but very powerful magic boosts and tons of Materia slots. The Striking Staff, which can be stolen from the rare enemy Elagor in the train graveyard very early on in the game, is extremely powerful for the beginning of the game, boasting the same exact stats and materia slots as the Hard Edge, but with one extra magic and an added bonus to crit chance. The Fairy Tail, which is automatically dropped from Reno during the optional fight with the Turks and Gungaga, has seven materia slots, more than any other weapon you can receive for any character until much later in the game. But there is one weapon that defies all of that logic so far, one weapon that throws all of Aerith's mage-like mechanics as well as the general game mechanics right out the window, and is probably my favorite weapon in the whole game, the Princess Guard. This weapon breaks all the rules, and can easily lead to some crazy moments for those who don't know its true power. First of all, the Princess Guard is Aerith's ultimate weapon, but is extremely unique in comparison to all the other ultimate weapons. It is received in the Temple of the Ancients, far before the end of the game, and requires no special quest to receive it. It's obviously given to the player this early because Aerith permanently leaves the party after Disc 1, 
but this also means that its impact helps to drive home the emotional weight of her being gone. You only get to use this weapon for two boss fights, the Red Dragon and Demon's Gate, and there is no way to use it outside of the temple since you can't leave once you enter. Unlike all of the other ultimate weapons that have eight connected materia slots and no materia growth, the Princess Guard has six connected materia slots and one disconnected slot, and has normal materia growth. It also has a massive 52 attack and a 22 magic buff, more than double all her other weapons minus the Aurora Rod which gives 14. Like the other ultimate weapons, it has a hidden power, but it's much different than the rest, instead sharing its power with Cloud's Yoshiyuki Blade. The Princess Guard gains attack power based on dead party members. If one party member is dead, it will gain double attack power, and if both other party members are dead, it will gain triple attack power. This weapon is so interesting because it completely turns the conventions of Aerith's character upside down. Instead of being the best character in the game for keeping your party members alive, she is now the strongest party member in the game if your party members are dead. And by strongest, I really mean strongest, as the power of the Princess Guard is completely insane with its special ability. Aerith can easily swing for 1400 damage with attacks and counterattacks, and 2800 damage with crits and death blow. For comparison, Cloud usually hits for around 700 damage at this point in the game if he's equipped with the Nail Bat, the zero materia weapon that exists only for its high attack. As mentioned before, Aerith's limit breaks are extremely unique and don't deal any damage at all, instead focusing on healing and buffing the party. They really help add depth to the limit break system, and it's a real shame that you can only use them for the first part of the game. Most players only ever see her first two or three limit breaks, since they don't get ample time to unlock them all. She does take slightly less limit break uses and kills to unlock her limit breaks than the first few party members, but this doesn't make a huge difference in casual playthroughs, and Kate Sith, Vincent, and Sid still take far less than her. They most likely did this as another cover-up for her eventual death, as if the players received her limit breaks too quickly, they could begin to get suspicious. In addition to that, unlocking Aerith's limit breaks is even slower because many players tend to hold on to her limit breaks until they are needed, since they focus more on healing, whereas for the other party members, they're more inclined to spam them every time they receive them. Now let's talk about her limit breaks, starting with, believe it or not, one of the strongest limit breaks in the game, Healing Wind. Healing Wind, at first glance, seems pretty simple. When Aerith uses Healing Wind, she heals the entire party, including herself, for half of their max HP. However, the true power of Healing Wind lies in the details. First of all, it heals for half of max HP, meaning that it will continue to scale as the game progresses. In mods or special playthroughs where Aerith is in the party near the end of the game, Healing Wind will still be healing for the same percentage. Healing Wind is also a level 1 limit break, meaning it fills up pretty fast. Aerith's level 1 limit constant, which is a value that determines how much damage she needs to take to get her limit break, is 200, which is actually one of the highest level 1 constants, but still low in comparison to other later limit breaks. This number means that she needs to take 66.4% of her max health in damage before her limit gauge will be full. So, every time she takes 66% of her health in damage, she gets to heal the entire party 50% of their health for free, no need for Materia or MP. This is already pretty good. If an enemy is mostly focusing Aerith and they are hitting for just around that 66% sweet spot, they will fill her limit bar two separate times before finally killing her, just from her using Healing Wind and nothing else. However, there is a mechanic in the game that pushes Healing Wind even further, Fury. Fury is a status ailment that lowers a character's accuracy by 30%, but increases their limit break gauge buildup by double. Accuracy in general doesn't matter much for Aerith, she isn't normally attacking enemies, and although the occasional magic attack can miss under Fury, it's pretty rare. But double limit break buildup is extremely useful for Aerith, and pushes the healing wind limit break damage requirement under 50%, meaning that she now heals more than the damage required to build up the limit break. There are many scenarios where an entire party can survive almost indefinitely with only Healing Wind if Aerith is given the Cover Materia and Fury. But above all else, the true power of Healing Wind 
in all of Aerith's healing limit breaks by extension, boils down to one simple fact. Healing wind can interrupt. Limits are a special case in Final Fantasy VII because they interrupt all actions, and Aerith's limit breaks, as well as clear tranquil slots and a few draining limit breaks, are the only sources in the game that can both interrupt and heal. During a playthrough of Final Fantasy VII, if a player dies, it's often because they had queued up a healing spell, but died before the healing spell could go off. Because of this, the main way to stay alive in Final Fantasy VII is to know when damage is coming and plan your healing sources in advance. However, Aerith defies the need for this, since as long as she has a healing wind ready, you can get a full party, no MP cost, 50% heal at any time you need it, with no need to wait for her turn. Aerith's second limit break, Seal Evil, is her only offensive style limit break, and casts Stop and Silence on all enemies. It's worth mentioning that Seal Evil casts Stop, which lasts longer than Paralysis, which is what Cross Slash inflicts. Her third limit break, Breath of the Earth, is basically a full party remedy, with the added benefit of also curing Slow and Stop. Her fourth limit break, Fury Brand, is a super unique limit that fills the other party member's limit break bars to full. This is the only ability in the game that specifically affects the limit bar, and since it is only a level 2 limit break, it fills up much faster than level 3 and level 4 limit breaks, making it a really effective tool for building up Omni Slash and other strong limits. Her fifth limit, Planet Protector, is another extremely unique limit break that gives all party members the Peerless status effect, a supremely powerful status that protects from all HP and MP damage, all negative status effects, and protects from losing positive status effects. Her sixth limit break, Pulse of Life, combines the remedy effect of Breath of the Earth with a full HP and MP heal. It can also revive dead party members. Aerith's ultimate limit break, Great Gospel, restores the entire party's HP and MP and gives the entire party peerless. In order to obtain Aerith's Ultimate Limit Break Manual, you must travel to a cave north of Junon that can be accessed by going over the river with the buggy. Since you obtain the buggy after the Coral Prison, you must backtrack all the way to Cosa del Sol, enter Cosa del Sol with the buggy, then ride the cargo ship back to Junon, which also transfers the buggy to the First Continent. The sleeping old man in this cave will give you the Mithril item if you talk to him when the total number of battles you have fought ends in two matching odd numbers or two zeros. You then must give the mithril item to the man in the house northeast of Gungaga after obtaining the tiny bronco from Rocket Town. The man will ask you to pick from a large box and a small box. The large box contains a gold armlet, an equipment you can simply buy in Rocket Town, and the small box contains the Great Gospel Manual. Fun fact, you can actually go back to the old man and get a second mithril, then turn it in for the item you didn't pick the first time. You can also get infinite of either item if you pick that item and never pick the other, but as soon as you have at least one of each item, the old man will stop giving you mithrils. Overall, Aerith is an extremely strong character in all parts of the game, even if you use a glitch or cheat to keep her in the party after her death. She is the only character capable of using the peerless status, one of the only characters with a heal that can interrupt, and the only character that can revive and fully heal with an interrupt, incredible magic and MP stats which can be vital for late game strategies, and has some of the best weapons in the game for the time you pick them up, specifically the Striking Staff, Fairy Tail, and Princess Guard. Her only true weakness is her late game weapons, as of course she has none, and her ultimate weapon post game is terrible in comparison to the others, but of course it is, as it wasn't designed for the post game. And honestly, her limit breaks like Healing Wind, Planet Protector, and Great Gospel still make her a great asset to the team against any enemy. It is pretty absurd how strong Aerith can be with the right strategy. Things like long range materia, sadness, and back row can make her extremely tanky even with her low defense stats, and she can dish out ridiculous damage with the Princess Guard, Death Blow, and Counter Attack. One final thing to mention about her gameplay, I mentioned before that after the Demon Wall fight, you lose whatever armor and weapon was equipped to Aerith forever. This is due to the way Final Fantasy VII was programmed. They programmed a way to have no accessory equipped, but no way to completely remove other equipment. Because of this, there is a line of code that removes all of Aerith's materia and her accessory, 
but they were unable to do anything with her weapon and armor. One fix they could have implemented was to create a separate guard stick and bronze bangle and equip them to Aerith, swapping her weapon and armor back into your inventory. But this was most likely too complicated and could have been tricky if the player's inventory was full. It also would have been a sign that she wasn't coming back. However, there is one way the player themselves can bypass this problem. During the cutscene where Cloud gives Sephiroth the Black Materia, there is one very small window where the player can press Menu right as Cloud is about to attack Aerith, and the menu will pop up. You can then swap Aerith's weapon and armor out, then exit the menu to resume the cutscene. Aerith's creation is a very interesting one, as she was one of the first three characters created for Final Fantasy VII. Cloud, Barrett, and Aerith were at one point the first playable characters, and for the story themes to work, the team knew that they would have to kill off one of the main characters, so Barrett and Aerith were the candidates. They decided that Barrett, the character that starts off cold to Cloud but eventually becomes a friend, would be a bit too predictable. So they chose Aerith and began crafting her character as an ill-fated hero who would sacrifice herself for the planet. Nomura would go on to say that the reaction from the fans to her death proved that she was a successful character in the end. Another interesting tidbit is that one point early in creation, the team played with the idea of Aerith being related to Sephiroth, and even made her hair similar to his. At one point, they thought that she could be his sister, at another point, even his former lover, before switching gears with the creation of Zack. Now, I'm going to go off script here for a minute because this is one of my favorite parts of the Final Fantasy VII story, and I want to take this opportunity to talk about it. During the creation of Aerith's character, Tifa was created as a rival for Cloud's affections. They even designed the characters as foils, both personality-wise and physically, like giving Aerith a long dress to counteract Tifa's shorts. However, as the characters developed, Tifa became the main love interest of Cloud since he was a child, and Aerith became a distraction to pull him away from her and help develop his character further. Now, they could have just created some promiscuous girl to lure Cloud away from Tifa, but Aerith's character didn't really fit that stereotype. Although a perky and playful girl, Aerith is deeply spiritual and loving. So the writers had to come up with an idea to have Cloud and Aerith begin to fall in love with each other that would fit their characters, but also the main themes of the game. And what they came up with was Zack Cloud. By combining the characters of Zack and Cloud through Cloud's traumatic experiences with Hojo, they were able to perfectly blend together so many aspects of the story into perfect harmony. Aerith begins to fall in love with Cloud because he acts like and feels similar to Zack, which not only makes sense due to Cloud's past, but also fits into her story of hiding her powers away until she one day realizes her true destiny. Cloud getting along with Aerith also makes sense as Zack's personality has blended with his and causes him to be more extroverted and comfortable around women. Cloud being pulled away from Tifa at this time makes sense for her story as well, as she is struggling with her own ability to be truthful to him, and when she finally opens up to him, it's the final piece of the puzzle to transform him back to true Cloud. They could have just simply created a character that pulls Cloud away from Tifa in order to satisfy the love triangle trope, but they instead wove Zack into the mix in order for every character to grow in a natural way. Due to this, all of the pieces perfectly fall into place by the end. Tifa learns to be truthful, Cloud becomes himself again, and Aerith follows her destiny, with none of those interactions between those characters being forced just to make any of the endings come true. Thanks to the introduction of Zack Cloud, all of these conversations make sense in the context of the story, but also make sense in the context of the characters, and how we as the player would actually think they would react in those circumstances. So yeah, just wanted to throw that in there. Final Fantasy VII storytelling is amazing. We talked earlier about the translation of Aerith's name, but where does her name actually come from? Her first name, as mentioned before, was created to sound similar to the word Earth, but her last name, Gainsborough, actually comes from the legendary French pop singer Serge Gainsbourg and can be loosely translated to a clever person from the city. One amazing detail about Aerith's name is its relation to the sixth Sephra in the Tree of Life, Tifereth. 
In Jewish mysticism, a religion that is often referenced in Final Fantasy VII, Tifereth is commonly associated with beauty, miracles, spirituality, compassion, and in some ways, sacrifice. When Tifa's character was made, certain parts of Aerith's original concept were transferred to her in order to make her the main love interest of Cloud. Because of this, it is very possible that Tifereth was split to create the two names, Tifa and Aerith. Her name is also connected to Sephiroth, the ten attributes through which God appears, and obviously where Sephiroth derived his name. Another one of these attributes, Chesed, means kindness or love, and seems very connected to Aerith's character. Firstly, multiple qualities of Chesed align with Aerith, including healing the sick and offering hospitality to strangers. Secondly, the Talmud says, the Torah begins with Chesed and ends with Chesed. And in Final Fantasy VII, the first and last image given to the player is Aerith. Thirdly, the Chesed is the first of the attribute of action, which may relate to how Aerith makes the journey herself to pray for Holy. And lastly, and probably the most interesting, the Gematria, a Hebrew cipher still used in Jewish culture today, of the word Chesed, reveals the number 72, and Aerith's birthday is February 7th. Aerith has two songs relating to her in the game, Aerith's Theme and Flowers Blooming in the Church, and also has an additional song in Advent Children entitled Water, which many people haven't heard, but go listen to it, it's pretty good. You can also hear parts of her theme in the Great Northern Cave, the second world map theme. Riki, the singer of Isn't It Wonderful from Final Fantasy X, created a lyrical adaptation of Aerith's theme for her album featuring Isn't It Wonderful. Aerith's legacy will always firmly place her as one of the most influential video game characters of all time. She is consistently placed as one of the best and most memorable Final Fantasy characters and is consistently used or mentioned in material outside of the original game. She has also made many cameos in games outside of the franchise, like Star Ocean, Little Big Planet, Parasite Eve, and even World of Warcraft. Aerith has, of course, made her grand return in the Final Fantasy VII Remake, where her character has some notable changes, but we will discuss those in the future, as the remake isn't completely finished yet, and trying to explain the differences in this video would be both a monumental task and very confusing. As for the original character, I will never forget how she tore my heart out during my first playthrough of the game, or the absolute dumpster fire she created on the internet with all of her resurrection hoaxes, or how she elevated the game with her story of tragedy, compassion, and self-sacrifice. Aerith is, above all else, the standard on how to make an influential and memorable video game character. Thank you very much for watching this in-depth look at Aerith. If you want to see more in-depth looks, there's a playlist down below you can click. There's also a playlist down there with all of my big edited Final Fantasy videos. So if you're interested in that, be sure to click that and check it out. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to thank all the people that helped me with this specific video, though. Uh, Pet Friend Amy helped with the intro with reviving Aerith. And uh, Kozan helped with the translation stuff with Aerith's name. So I wanted to thank those two people. And then also I wanted to thank my big patrons. Uh, these are the people that make in-depth what it is. Uh, I don't have to do ad reads. I don't have to make the video shorter or longer to appease any contracts. Uh, I can just make the video what it needs to be. I can make it the exact length that it needs to be to fully explore these characters. And that's thanks to these people. So thank you very, very much to you guys. Um, I think that is it. If you want to help support for free, you can consider subscribing. That always really helps. If you want to help monetarily, you can check out the Patreon. It is only a dollar for the tier that gets you all of the extra videos um, that I make behind the scenes and stuff. So uh, that is something you can consider if you do want to help monetarily. But seriously, no pressure. I just appreciate you watching the video in the first place. And doing anything you can to support, whether that be subscribe or share the video, 
or just watch it yourself. I appreciate all of it. Thank you very, very much. And I will see you in the next in-depth look.